Hello everyone, welcome back to Contractor Evolution. Today's conversation is with Dan Young of Kingdom Roofing Systems in Marion, Indiana. Now in just three short years, from 2018 to 2021, Dan grew Kingdom from three million in annual revenue to over 16 million. Contributing massively to this explosive growth is his executive leadership team, which over the years he has assembled and put together with tremendous care and purpose. Now I wanted to have Dan on to talk specifically about where he found these people and then how he nurtured that underappreciated talent into truly exceptional leadership. So if you've been wondering what it actually takes to create a leadership team within your own business, Dan is about to break it all down for you. So we talk about a few things. Um, how an always be recruiting mindset and an eye for talent allow you to see the gifts in people that lesser leaders can't. Uh, we talk about the idea of farm raising your own A players instead of looking outside the organization for them, which is both risky and expensive. And lastly, we get into how to balance family business vibes with scalable structure and accountability. Enlightened and articulate, Dan shares both his story and his leadership philosophy in a way that we can all learn from. So I really hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. You're watching Contractor Evolution where we unpack the systems, tactics, and skills you need to take your fast-growing contracting business to the next level. You're here to learn what it takes to scale up, work less, and increase profitability. You've come to the right place. Stay tuned to learn what separates the new breed of contractor from the old school, and welcome to your ultimate guide on the business of contracting. Dan, it's really good to see you. Thank you for coming on the show today. I'm excited to talk. Absolutely, man. Thanks for having us. So I want to just give the listener a bit of a backstory on you and Kingdom. Um, you know, the first time I met you, I actually remember it was at it was at a small roofing conference. I think it was in New Orleans. It was probably four or five yeah. years ago. And you, you know, you met we met. And you were like, man, I really like this Breakthrough Academy thing. It sounds cool. I'm not quite ready yet. Give me a year. Give me a two years or something. And lots of people say that, but you actually kept your word. And so it's been. Uh, it's obviously been a pleasure, uh, you know, working with you over the last few years. But I think what's more impressive is just like the the, the growth that uh, that kingdom has gone through. Tell us a bit about how you got your start, your entrepreneurial journey, but uh, especially like just these this trajectory that you've been on over the last few years. Yeah, absolutely. So. Long story short, actually, uh, I've really been an entrepreneur since I was a little kid. I mean, I was running businesses when I was four and five years old. You know, the shoveling snow to painting addresses on curbs to slinging pogs and slammers, basketball cards. It didn't matter. I was always doing something to hustle. So um, I went to college at uh, Purdue University for construction and technology. And uh, when I got out, I moved to a small town to be with my family in Marion, Indiana, um, about 50,000 people in the whole town. Um, within a couple of years, started my first business, and it was really intended to primarily be uh, an opportunity to give employment opportunities and jobs to um, different ministries and people in church and our community, a lot of people that needed second chances. So we use it really as a platform to you know, train and develop people and give them a trade. So that's where the, the business really started. Um, I, I ended up in the roofing industry. Uh, a, a guy I went to church with, his son, um, was a national storm chaser. So he worked hurricanes, um, you know, tornadoes, hail, been doing that since uh, about 05. Yeah. So he was on the road for eight or nine years, and uh, his dad introduced us. Um, felt like we had a lot in common. So I met him. I was running a property management company at the time. We were doing window washing, tree removal, lawn care, landscape, hardscape, uh, just about anything that was um, good for people that maybe had a background or needed a second yep. chance, you know, that type of, that type of trade. Uh, did that for years. Met him. He said, hey, you got some free time. Why don't you come over and learn about this insurance restoration stuff? So I spent about 90 days with him um, the second year of a storm. It was in 2010 in Marion, Indiana. He had been on the road. A hailstorm hit his hometown. Um, so they had been there for over a year. They were winding the storm down. All the other salesmen right. had left because there was basically nothing left, right? Um, 
And so I, uh, I came in, sell, sold, built, collected, and, and earned about $40,000 in commission in about 90 days. And that was back in 2010-11 um, period. And I realized, like, man, this is really good money. I'm just scratching the surface. I don't even know the industry. Yeah. And I'm making over 10K a month. Yeah. And this light switch went on, like, hey, if I can do that, other people can do that. And I can teach other people to do that. So... His plan was actually to go back on the road, and I just approached him and said, hey, listen, I'm going to start a local brick-and-mortar roofing company. If you want to stay, be a business partner with me. Man, I would love to, to do that together. If not, I totally get it. And he's like, yeah, I've been on the road for 10 years. Let's give it a shot. Um, you know, and, and, and we really hit the ground running. We put $2,000 into a bank account, never put another dollar back in. We cash flowed the whole thing from the get, and I was just a – young, dumb entrepreneur that had enough juice to put it all on the line um, and didn't know any better, to be honest. A lot yeah. of my success is probably from drive and ignorance. Um, and yeah, man, we just ran as hard as we could. Drive so, and ignorance. Those are those, you know, that's actually kind of a good yeah, combo yeah. sometimes because you got, you right? got the, you got the cojones to do the things, but the ignorance helps to a degree because you don't really overthink yeah. it. You just get on the field and make some plays. Now, exactly. you, guys, you guys have grown a lot, obviously, you know, since that moment, two grand into the, into the account and you guys never look back. Um, and Mar Marion's a much, is qu quite a small market as I understand as well too. So just tell us about like how the company has developed since, since go. Sure. Yeah. 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 So, uh, open the doors in 2012 and we do about a half million year one and then we're just double and we go from a half million to a million, a million to two, two to three. And then, at three million, um, I was part of a, a small consulting group, and a gentleman there was one of the directors. Said, "Hey, you guys are really growing fast. You need somebody who's got experience in operations and finances to help build the framework to really scale the business." And so, in the very beginning, our philosophy was really growth through investment. And so, we were taking every dime of profit. We were not we were not taking a salary. Uh, I think our first year, I made. I pulled seven grand out. Our second year was like 10 or 12. Wow. Uh, third year was like 15. So I'm hustling on the side, running a second business. I'm buying and selling cars and taking no money out of the account. And we're just reinvesting everything. So we brought in a gentleman that was about 55. He had a lot of uh, success in the past. Um, and, you know, he's towards the end of his career. And so he's really looking to cash out. And so he instantly put everybody on salaries. We started getting scheduled distributions and his philosophy was really profit through savings. Mm. And so he was trying to reduce the investment so we could, we could take regular income. What this really did was it created this tension, right? Between we're young entrepreneurs investing for this 30, 40, 50 year legacy type plan and he's saying, man, I got 10 years left. I need to make as much money and stack as much cash as possible. Well, he comes in, he's operating as the COO and CFO, mm. and he's making a lot of the financial decisions. He starts stripping back marketing. He starts stripping back um, branding. He doesn't want to make long-term commitments like lines of credit and things like that. And so he wants to keep his name off of things. And we spend from 2014 when he became a partner through 2018 – basically hovering between three and $4 million. But you guys just and had completely different goals, completely totally. different goals. He's Absolutely. trying to bolster up net and trim stuff. So as much trickles down as possible, you're yeah. like, Hey, like let's build something substantial here. Let's create a foundation yeah. we can grow on. And those are just, you know, those two outcomes are not even remotely aligned. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Polar, polar opposite. And so there's this crazy tension, you know, we're kind of at each other, you know, there, there's this like, public tension where people can feel it, see it, hear it. Um, so in 2018, I finally approached him and just said, Hey, listen, man, this doesn't work. We got two different goals. You know, it's a buy sell, you know, it, you know, I, it, I basically put a, a force buy sell on the table yeah. uh, and said, you're going to buy me or I'm going to buy you, but this doesn't work. And so Ryan, who's my current business partner and the original business partner basically said, Hey, me and you need to keep this running. I'm not interested in being partners with him. We have different philosophies. So we bought him out in uh, April of 2018. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so we're halfway into the season. I, I take over. One of the things I negotiated with Ryan is, listen, there's been this three-way partnership. It's very difficult. If we're going to do this, this is what I want. I want you to give me 12 months. I want 12 months of control as the CEO and CFO, and I'm going to make all the financial decisions. I'm going to make the strategic decisions. I'll present them to you. We won't execute unless we agree, but I want to be at the helm. Mm. So he allowed that. Um, we went from three and a half to, to six million dollars that year. Um, long story short, from from halfway through eighteen through the twenty twenty one season, we went from about three and a half million to sixteen point one. Um, it was about six hundred five hundred six hundred percent growth in about three and a half years. Um, when I bought him out, the first thing I did was I I tripled down on coaching, right? Because I knew. I don't know what I don't know. I've never run the financials. I've never run the operational side of the business. I am a salesman at heart, and I want to go out and sell projects and recruit guys and teach guys how to do that. And so I had to really switch gears, and it become a moment of like, this is college for the trades. And so um, I hired Les O'Hara. Uh, from the Build 12 group out of Chicago. He's a general coach. Mm -hmm. um, I became meeting with him two to three times a week. We were working on marketing operations and finances, and he was fantastic for about a year and a half. I hired WebRunner out of Canada at the same time. Mm -hmm. Not only did they take over my marketing, but what I started doing was I started meeting, meeting with them, and they were coaching me at a very high level on how to run a proper marketing department mm -hmm. and I met with them weekly for years then about the same time I also hired Breakthrough Academy and I started uh, going through their course I've been with Breakthrough Academy for about three years um, obviously wholeheartedly believe in the program because between these three coaches you know we scale from three and a half to 16 million and now not only is the business growing like crazy you know, I own and operate 10 other companies on top of this company. Um, and it's the the operational, financial, and marketing piece is what's really given us the infrastructure to allow me to do all these other things. I, we don't need to spend too long on it. I'm just curious. What it Maybe rattle off a few of the other 10 companies. <laughs> Let's go through the side hustles of yeah. Dan Young. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this year we're opening the doors. We've been in a 12-month renovation of, a, of a, an event center called the Covenant Place. Yeah. So it's an 11,000 square foot modern farmhouse barn style, you know, uh, uh, venue. Okay. Um, so we've got a company called Gutters with a Z, and that launched about two weeks ago. So it's a gutter company that's prepped for a national franchise. Yeah. It's starting off as the primary gutter installer for Kingdom Roofing. Mm -hmm. So obviously, it, you know, we sell six or seven gutter jobs a day. There's a ton of work there. Once we really perfect the subcontracting model, the main focus will be direct to consumer. Yep. Um, if you do your research, the largest home improvement company in the United States is actually Leaf Filter. They're over a $1 billion a year business. Is that right? And the, absolutely, man, they're smashing. So they don't focus on gutters though. And so we feel that if you think of large gutter businesses, they're all gutter guards. They're not gutter companies. Right. Um, and so we really want to integrate the two. Cool. So we've got that. Um, and then I've got a bunch of short-term rentals. And so I've got units in Nashville, uh, Chicago, Milwaukee, the Dominican Republic, multiple in Indiana. Um, so yeah. a mix of real estate. And then, you know, we, we have other commercial real estate holdings, rentals, things like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool, cool. You got tons in motion, man. That's so good. And I think, you know, that just going back, I want to make sure that listeners catch this 3.5 to six. And then in fairly short order, you, you, you brought it up to 16.1 million. And what, what was that? Three, 2018 to 2021. So it's like three short years. You're essentially quadrupling the business a little more actually. Yeah. Yeah. It's awesome. It's awesome. Now, one of the things, and this is really the, the, the part of the discussion I'm excited to dive into. One of the things that you have credited to uh, sustaining this kind of growth um, and allowing you to look into the future the way that you are, which we're going to talk about at the end, 
um, is is a really really strong leadership team. And so I, I got questions about how you find a leadership team, how you nurture people, how you grow people, how you find the right roles and permanent homes for high performers, all this stuff. But maybe let's just get a bit of a lay of the land. Um, tell our listeners how you have organized your leadership team with sort of names, roles, um, and just maybe even a couple just thoughts or quick backstory on each individual here. Yeah, for sure. So the way our company is structured is we have an executive team. There's three of us in the executive team. So it's me, my partner, and our COO. Underneath that, we have a team of six senior leaders, which includes the executive team plus three additional uh, department managers. Underneath that, we have a management team. And then underneath that is our, uh, our teammates. So at the senior leadership level, you've got my business partner, who his background was really, really storm chasing and yep. it was primarily heavily roofing driven. Um, his skill set is very unique in that um, he's a gunslinger, right? So, like, he's your typical gunslinger that problems pop up and it's whack a mole. He can just put these problems to bed very, very quickly, but he's not strong at eliminating problems from coming down the pipeline. You know, so that is when there's any kind of a challenge is, hey, Ryan will take care of it. And he's smashing that problem really quickly. Right. Um, then our other executive is our COO, Christy Crisp. So her background is Great really Great name, unique. by the way. I know. I love Christy it. Christy Crisp. So, that looks crisp exactly. on a business card, I bet. Yeah, Holy. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. Tell us about her. Yeah. So her history is actually in marketing and operations. So... She spent a lot of time at a local company uh, or local missions-based uh, business. It's a nonprofit called World Gospel Mission. They're an international missionary organization. She started off as like an administrative assistant and then moved her way up the rankings of like a, they got like five or 600 employees and yeah. became like a VP of operations or something. Something just like, how did that happen? Yeah. Um, then she moved over to United Way and went from like a marketing assistant to a marketing director to an op a person in operations. So um, we hired her and she started off as our marketing director. Um, and within about six months, what I'm seeing is we have these operation issues and she's able to take her skill and craft of being able to create and build um and design these um, workflow charts and all these different things and make them aesthetically beautiful but very easy to understand and she also be she began gaining the trust of a lot of employees she became like the counselor of kingdom roofing I mean, somebody has a problem they're going to her office and she's listening right and so we promoted her from a marketing director to a COO within about six months when we started seeing this mixed bag of tricks the true talents um, yeah Man, it's 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 um, almost magical to see him play. Um, then I've got our general manager. So uh, Donald Beal, very interesting, went to church with him for years. He was an assistant general manager for Walmart. And his specialty was kind of, uh, you know, the produce section was having problems. They were throwing too much produce away. They would send him over. He would put in processes and get it substantially above their, uh, you know, their deliverables, outperform, and then they'd move them over to, you know, sports, whatever, sporting goods. And he was like this guy that they would just pivot around to solve problems. And he had a lot of uh, corporate training through Walmart. And so I spent about seven years every time I'd see him just poking the bear like, hey, man, when are you going to quit your job and come work for us? And yeah. so I'm just constantly poking at him. And, you know, he had been there for 19 years. So he's like, do I really give this up and start all over? Uh, so he finally took the leaf. You know, we brought him in as a GM and he's he's really excelled. And God, he, he just does. He's that if you got a problem, you give it to him and he figures it out. Yeah. Um, then uh, Ashley Shelby. um she came in as an administrative assistant. So she worked with, uh, she worked in the healthcare field and she answered phones and did appointments and stuff at like doctor's offices. Um, so I brought her in and she was an administrative assistant. And then we started teaching her QuickBooks and started teaching her some financial stuff and uh, eventually became the head of the accounts payable um, uh, department. 
she became the head of the finance department yep. and now she sits on our senior leadership uh, team. And so kind of a weird role in that she heads up accounts payable, but she's also like our, I would call her like our internal cultural liaison. So like she carries the heartbeat of kingdom and she constantly is seeing, thinking and hearing the way our, the heartbeat of our employees. Yeah. So she's able to kind of act as a liaison and bring that to the executive team and say, Hey, this is kind of what the team's talking about. This is what they love. This is what they don't like. And so it's just really unique kind of heartfelt cultural role that you can't barely put a name to. Um, and then our VP of sales. So out of our, you know, our leadership team, um, you know, he's the only one from the industry. Yeah. So uh, he's a young VP. He's like 33 years old. He started off in the at Renewal by Anderson. He grew a region from 30 million to over 100 million in 24 months. Um, so he brought in this very high end retail model um, that was very scalable. And when we brought him in, it was with an intent to continue to transition from restoration and the dependence on storms. Yeah over to retail. So um, this year, right now, we're at 86% retail, 14% insurance. And uh, that's about where we want it to be. And it was really with his expertise. Yeah. You know, what's interesting is besides uh, your VP, is, what was his first name again? VP is Brad. 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 Ball. Brad. Okay. So besides Brad, your VP, no one here comes from within the industry, really. I mean, your partner right. does and you do to some degree, but um, everyone else here is, you know, a very interesting mix of backgrounds. You know, I, I want to know, like, how do you find these people? I'm assuming you're not just posting an ad on Indeed and, and the sort of the, the <laughs> talent pours in. Like, can you tell us a bit about your ground game? Yeah, yeah. Honestly, my experience is where we're geographically located, Indeed is almost useless. Um, you know, we're in a blue collar community. And to be quite honest, like we talked a little bit about this, but it's our blue ocean strategy. So the value of where we're at is that I don't really have any competition. Um, we have competitors, but there's no powerhouse roofing companies within a 30 mile radius, right? So that is kind of part of our superpower. Um, but it's also one of the biggest struggles because right we don't have a pool of talent to pull from, which really forces us to farm raise talent, the long game. Um, the, the ground game honestly is looking at people that you know or you've heard of and seeing these skills, talents, and gifts that could, could potentially translate. Mm -hmm. And then you bring them in, you're intentional, you give them more and more and more, and you see what do they do with it, right? Do they own it? And we're super big on ownership. Mm. Um, so a lot of these people are people that I know of, of super high integrity, super high intelligence, um, and they kind of have the heartbeat of what our vision is. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of it is, is kind of like a really good commercial salesman. You fill your pipeline. It takes one, two, three years to fill that pipeline. And then you continually work that pipeline. So it's, you know, the Donald Beal, it's a six, seven year poking every single time I say, Hey man, when are you going to quit? And, and cause you're at your ceiling now and you're going to come your, your floor here is higher than your ceiling there. You know, when are you willing to, to take a dive and, and to jump in and, in you know, when you look at this whole list, uh, there's one person that came from a recruiter. Right. You know, and that was Brad. And I was looking for a very specific talent. Um, we knew we wanted to move to a high end home improvement retail business. Yeah. And when I called a recruiter, the Tony Hody recruiter, Chris Williamson, uh, he basically said, you know, you've got to go to a high end window company to get a really high end retail sales manager. Um, so we had a very specific ideal candidate for that role. The rest of them was like, I really like you. I see a lot of talent. Let's see where you plug. Like I literally hire not, I, I, and you guys will not like this, but there's a lot of time I actually hire for all these other attributes, not even for the role. And it's like, we're going to bring you in, see what you can do with this. And maybe you'll stay there. Maybe you won't. But if you don't, like we know you're going to thrive somewhere, but you're so stinking talented. 
I got to get you in the door. I'm closing the deal and I'm figuring it out later, right? Like, what kind of attributes? Kind of like, what, like, you, do you walk around? Like, tell us about that. Like, you walk around as an entrepreneur in your relatively small market. You've got a church community. Maybe you have a softball community. Maybe you have friends through your kids and their school. I mean, yep. are you just kind of walking through life with like a talent lens, a talent acquisition lens? And if so, go tell us about the attributes that you really kind of hone in on or have developed a keen sight for? Yeah, so I'm looking for anybody that has the what I would call the it factor, right? So it's when you meet them, it's like, there's something different about that guy. There's something different about that girl, you know? Um, so that's one, like, I was out at my event center on the, this weekend and a guy pulls up on a scooter and he's there to sell... Um, you know, like uh, bug and rodent spray or something crazy. He didn't get three words out of his mouth. I'm in the country on a country block. He rode an electric scooter up to me. He's like, hey, man, I, I said, hey, how long you been doing canvassing? He's like, six months. I was like, are you happy? <laughs> he didn't even get to pitch me. I'm pitching him instantly, right. taking control. And I got his card and, you know, we're in contact now. He's going back to California, and it's like maybe one day we'll connect again. But I'm saving him in my my Rolodex. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like I'm looking for people. Um, I just hired a customer experience manager. So when I interviewed her, it's a lady I know from church. I've had my eye on her because she's got that it factor. I interviewed her, and she tells me like, yeah, I'm a department manager here. And I'm asking about like the structure, what she like, what she doesn't like. She's like, I don't really like that we don't have mandatory meetings in departments. And so I talked my team into having meetings after work because they wouldn't pay us for it. And I pay out of pocket to bring food and drinks and they don't have any coaching and developing structure there. So I'm paying, you know, so-and-so right. to, to coach me outside of work. Right. It's like, I don't got to hear a lot more. She's going That's, above and beyond. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. 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 Yeah, so I, I'm looking for the what I would call the hit factor. It's somebody who's going above and beyond. And, and for us, like, you have to be coachable and trainable. Teamwork has got to be huge. Um, and you've got to care about our customers, right? Like, the, the excellent side of delivering an excellent product. Um, and we're, a, you know, we're this family-oriented business with this mix of um, corporate scalability and yeah. systems and processes. And so... You're trying to find these hardcore performers that care about their colleague. And yeah. it is a really tough mix. Fine balance. And yeah, man. It's and it's tough to to not get too far on one side and lose the culture that we've built. Yeah, it's too family oriented and not enough stuff gets done and it's too corporate and you kind of lose the vibe that makes you love it in the first place. So you're constantly trying to thread that needle. And I think what's cool about those few examples you just rattled off from the guy selling whatever rodent repellent on the scooter yeah. to a lady you meet at church is like you are literally walking through life every waking hour with your talent radar on full and yeah. you're essentially collecting names and and off maybe not offering opportunities on the spot, but there's this 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 you know saying at BTA we have like always be recruiting. I think you live and breathe that yeah. to the nth degree. Now, one thing I I just see very clearly in in the picture you're painting here, we've got um, you know Christy Crisp comes with no roofing background, Donald uh, you know uh, managing the the Walmart produce section, making some cool changes there. Um, Ashley started with essentially no QuickBooks experience, is now an AP manager. And you use that term, I'm going to go back to a second ago, farm-raised talent farm raised. You're yeah. not out there hunting for it. You're not out there poaching. You're looking for diamonds in the rough. You're looking for unseen talented and you're, and you're nurturing from there. So like, what is your, take us through your overall philosophy on growing people. How do you nurture underappreciated talent into, into truly exceptional leaders? Yeah. So to me, it really starts with this um, ability, what we call it, pulling out the gold, right? So when when you're mining for gold, the gold doesn't sit on the surface of the ground very often, right? It, it is very hard. There's a lot of very intentional processes to strip gold out of earth. You got to process so much dirt to get the gold that you're looking for. 
And so there's this philosophy of we're, we're pulling the gold out of the earth, right? So we're kind of turning stuff over all the time and looking for, hey, man, what is, what is this person's talent? So when I start, when, when it was very interesting, when I first started my first business, I had a man that I respect very much look at me and say, dude, you're an entrepreneur. You are a business owner. You have to take the leap. You've got to start your own thing. And I didn't see it at all. Like I was always an entrepreneur, always operating as an entrepreneur, but I never saw myself as an entrepreneur. I just saw myself as a hustler. Yeah. Right. And so he had to call it out of me and he had to speak that in. So he spoke it out and then, and then pulled it out. Yeah. Um, and he was encouraging to me and telling me what he saw. And then that allowed me to begin to dream. And so we start with th th what you were talking about through the recruiting process of, Hey man, what, what do you think about? What do you think about? What are you doing? Do you, what do you like? What do you not like? And so that's kind of, we're, we're tailing the earth. We're processing dirt. I'm looking for gold. Oh, boom. I just found out you've got a background in marketing for 27 years and yeah. now you're working at the dentist's office what you're are you taking what are you there? you're taking uh, what do they do i'm not a minor so don't don't uh if there's a minor listening yeah. don't get mad at me but it's a core <laughs> sample you're like drilling for a core sample it's, you pull yeah, it out yeah. you, you have a geologist analyze it and it's like whoa we, i think we just hit pay dirt here let's do a couple more yeah. let's go deeper right that's kind of what you're talking exactly. about exactly yeah 100 percent so we're starting there right so once we decide hey this person's wor worth the long because we're looking at two, three, four year ROI on our employees, right? Yeah. Like, I know I'm losing money on the vast majority of my employees for a couple of years. So, we're looking at it from a is it worth, you know, leasing the land and tilling the dirt here long term? Is it worth it? Okay. So, once we do that, now it's time to I'm cast, I've cast vision to you of what I see, but now I want you to dream. So with our employees, we start with what's called a dream board. It's specifically in sales. We do a lot of it with our sales uh, people. And what we do is we give them a stack of magazines, right? And we give them the old school poster board, your three foot by four foot white poster board. And we say, hey, man, I want you to dream. If there was no limits, what could it look like? And they start tearing out pages and they start you know, gluing it on this poster board. And it's, I mean, I've got guys in here with everything from, Polaris razors to the new F-150 to a new house to I want kids. Yeah. I want enough money to have a family. Yeah. You know, I want to build a lake. I want to, uh, I've got a guy that works for me that is a retired pastor that went through a divorce and started over, uh, you know, in his late fifties, early sixties. And he has these very specific dream and vision for him and his sons and what that'll look like at you know at the retirement point of his life, and he's like, man, I, I want five years. I want to stack this much money. I'm going to buy a 150 acre lot in, in, in the UP. It's going to have a body of water. It's going to have 80 percent honey woods. It's going to have this house and this cabin. And he has this very distinct vision. And then he's got this truck on the property and this razor on the property. And he paints this picture in his own mind. And now he so believes it. Yeah. I believe it for him. Right. What? So, and so, you know, I'm curious like, so on that note, like, what do you think um, spiritually, philosophically, psychologically, like, what does that exercise, that vision boarding exercise do for the individual team players? And then what does it do as an aggregate for the culture that kind of circulates the building over there? Yeah. 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 So one of my favorite uh, Bible verses is a verse that says, without a vision, the people will perish. And so what I take from that is, you know, you look at like an Elon Musk, right? The dude's a visionary. He's accomplished what he's accomplished because he can see it here. He can articulate it here and he's got the juice to pursue it and put it all on the line. Right. And so what we do is we want to cast corporate vision but then we want to have personal vision yeah. and as a, as a culture, you know, we celebrate the wins of the individual. So we've got the poster board and the guys are X and off. It's like, dude, I got the F-150 and we're celebrating high-fiving and we're super pumped when these men and women win because what we're looking at is we're looking at people who oftentimes had no skill, no trade, no craft, 
They were underutilized. They were at their ceiling. They were not moving anywhere else. And they come here and it's like, wow, in 24 months, you bought you, you built your dream home. You bought your dream truck. You felt freedom to have your fourth kid that you didn't feel freedom about. You this, 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 yeah. this, and this. And they're just checking off their dream board, man. And now it's like, got to dream again, right? Like got to start all over because you smashed all your goals. What next? Um, yeah. Yeah, what yeah, next? yeah. And so... It, you know, that, that is, um, that type of, um, dreaming and energy, it's, it's just super energetic and it, it, and it takes over the whole culture. Right. And so that's what we're really looking for. And a lot of it really stems from the fact that I grew up, I don't want to say poor, but like you just had enough, right? Yeah. Like mom and dad are making your clothes because you can't go buy new clothes. I'm like coloring in fake check marks on the white t-shirt. So it looks like I got a Nike T and I'm getting made fun of at school um, to, hey man, I'm lived at, at 39 years old. I've accomplished more in my life today than I ever imagined possible yeah. by the time I retired. And I want that for everybody I know, love, and care about. So this vi this concept of vision is a very central part of the story of kingdom. And I think it's an incredibly powerful tool as a leader to help, help extract that from an individual team member. Because they're oftentimes they just haven't been the structure, haven't been given the structure or guidance or encouragement to do it themselves. And then once it's done it it's you're tying into a higher power something it i'm not going to say it's a self-fulfilling prophecy but prophecy but the statistical likelihood that they then go and achieve that is much higher there's another side to this coin though which is for you as a leader and maybe by extension your leadership team going back to this idea of like uh taking a core sample and seeing that we have some gold in here are there things about the way you manage train coach develop encourage hold accountable sometimes how do you how do you bring that gold more and more and more to the surface within the people because the goal setting the charting the vision is one part then there's the actual leveling up of the individual and by extension the team so how do you guys do that really well yeah i mean there's there's a huge mix there so um gsrs are absolutely the foundation of what we do so that was taught to us by breakthrough academy goal set review meetings so it's this meeting of hey every two weeks you get one hour focus with your supervisor about how do you meet your goals how do you ensure that you hit your deliverables and those meetings are really the foundation of a lot of this um, a lot of other things are, you know, we do things like personality tests. One of my favorite tests that we do um, is by Patrick uh, Lencioni. I'm not sure. Oh, we love Patrick Lencioni. We love Patrick yeah. Lencioni. Yeah. So it, it's called the widget. I don't know if you're familiar with it or not. Um, one of the things I love is like these personality tests that kind of unearth like, oh, that's why I tick that way. Like that, I kind of get it now. Right. So like, uh, we we're struggling with a couple of things in production, right? So like one of the things that we're struggling with is like identifying the core root of a, of a problem that we're seeing consistently and coming up with a way to resolve that, right? So like we go through and we give the management team this widget analysis where like widget stands for wonder, invention, discernment, galvanizing, enablement and tenacity mm -hmm. and what we found was our entire team there was nobody that had wonder or invention so like wonder is this natural gift of saying there's a greater possibility or a greater potential we can do more right and then invention is this i'm going to create an original idea to solve problems and what we found was everybody else was in discernment, galvanizing, enablement, and tenacity. And it's like, oh, okay, that's why we're struggling over here. We need to place somebody in management down here that is uber strong in wonder and invention. And so what we end up finding out is like, man, this thing that really bothers me about my colleague, it's because he's super strong with discernment but he's really weak with wonder and invention and I'm trying to force him to operate in wonder and invention, that's not a sweet spot, right? So then like we've, once we start identifying these strengths and weaknesses, it kind of helps us move the chess pieces around. Um, and then 
a lot of what we do is um, is development, and we we do that through a lot of different types of ways. So, like right now, we're building out an online university through through Lessonly, you know, which is which is super vital. Yeah. We're working with BTA, and we're um, we're building out some some interesting software. I don't want to give away your <laughs> guys' okay. keep whatever. Um, keep it top secret. <laughs> we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've hired an organization called 240 Solutions. So they're literally a cultural, a cultural people first coaching organization. So they literally come in and teach leaders how to put people first above and beyond everything else, like above profits, above whatever. Um, and so like we're paying them to one-on-one coach, train and develop our, our leadership team. So it, you know, th- this whole philosophy of what you're asking, like there's so many fronts to it yeah. and it, it, it feels like sometimes like you're just meeting after meeting, after meeting, after meeting, but then you have an administrative assistant that's your accounts payable manager sitting on your senior leadership team in two years. And you're like, Oh, it really this works. Maybe this does work. And you're investing people. Yeah. yeah. I think, um, I think that that is a really, really uh, powerful point because it's so easy to see someone where they are and it's much more difficult to see where someone could be. And so that lens of like, this is uh, the present moment lens versus the future cast lens is difficult. And it's sort of it like it sort of depends on your where you're at on the cynicism versus optimism spectrum. Some people have this innate ability to see potential and other people's are only able to see limitations and where people are this exact moment. And I just think that's that's something that you clearly do exceptionally well is, is see that potential, see where they could see where they could go. Yeah, it, I mean, it's a mix. I'm, um, I'm a little bit of a unique individual in that I'm, I'm also the person that's raising the flag of, hey, guys, this is a problem coming down the road. But that has to do with a different gift of um, really kind of discernment. This air, we talked a little bit about earlier, this aerial view. So as the CEO, I feel it's my responsibility to cast vision and see where we're going in the future. Yeah. And so to do that, you've got to kind of raise up, get up to the, to the top of the wall, you know, um, look out on the horizon, see what's coming and raise the flag of, Hey, the enemy's coming, the glory's coming, the battles, whatever is coming. And so it's this constant tension between, um, we're visionary, we're casting vision into the future, but we're also looking for all of the potential issues. And that's where this like weird tension kind of happens. And so, um, you know, I, I can be just as good at cast and vision as I can be. Um, you know, hey, if you don't if you don't watch this, this yeah. thing's going to bite you. You know, one thing I think listeners would be curious about is the change to your role as a leader that installing. Uh, I should say growing this leadership play this leader this executive team to where they are now you know, what that has freed you up to do and how your role has changed. So you're talking a little bit about the tension between like visionary and integrator or like big picture versus like day to day kind of stuff. What, yeah. how, how has, how has Dan's week to week changed as this group matures and where do you think it's going in the future? Do you anticipate you spending more time in certain places of your business than you were before? Like just maybe for someone who's, who's looking at this going, you know, what Dan's talking about, that's where I'm going. I, they're probably wondering like how your actual role and responsibilities and focus, mental focus, where your, where your energy kind of shifts and goes to as you transition. Yeah, really, really good question. So, When I had the third business partner that was operating as the CFO and the COO, I was spending the vast majority of my time in sales and building salespeople, right? So when he leaves and I basically ask for the reins, well, all of a sudden, the company's depending on my sales, plus they're they're depending on me to be a leader and direct the ship in the right direction. So what was really interesting was I, I couldn't stop what I was currently doing, right? This... 60 hour work week of producing sales and building salespeople. Right. And so I've, I've got to start this transition of working on the business and not in the business as much. And so 
for years, probably two or three years. I actually worked more, not less. So I'm, I'm doing the 60 hours I was already doing. Plus now I'm shoving five to 10 additional hours down the pipe on working on the business. And then what ends up happening is this transition from substantially in the business to substantially on the business. And you end up gaining this momentum where the beautiful part of doing that upfront work and upfront investment is I feel like the bigger you get, the better your team is, the more freedom and liberty you have and the easier your job actually gets. And so it is very much this, you know, today I'm going to live like no one else. I'm going to work my butt off. I'm going to put seeds in the ground. I'm investing in the future and I'll reap a harvest in two, three, four years. So I started that super hard work back in 2018. And now in 2022, you know, the vast majority of my time is spent with my senior leadership team and really coaching, training, and developing them. And that's been, um, that's been a hard challenge for me as the CEO because I'm very used to making all the big decisions. I'm very used to being totally in control. I'm very used to understanding and knowing everything that's happening. You know, every rally customer to every award and certification. Um, and about a year and a half ago, when we hired 240 Solutions, this cultural training group, um, he coached me. He, he asked me one day, he said, Dan, do you really want leaders or do you just like the idea of having strong people in your organization? <laughs> That's a great question, isn't it? Um, yeah, man. I'm like, well, what do you mean? He's like, so you have a senior leadership meeting and you lead it and you talk most of the time and you already have the solution and you're just laying the solution out. How are you ever going to build leaders like that? I'm like, okay, so I had to walk away saying like, wow, do I really want leaders? Like, do I really want to give thing, but do I want to give my baby away and trust it with other people? And am I really okay with them failing? Am I really okay with them not doing it the Dan way? You know, am I okay with that? And so I had a heart check of, am I saying this or do I really want it? And so I had to go back to him kind of tail tuck, like, man, you're right. I've been saying I want leaders, but I've not been acting like it. And so what does that look like? He's like, just randomly don't show up to a senior leadership meeting. Just see what happens. Just randomly walk out in the middle of the meeting, stop talking, just literally stop talking in the middle of the meeting and see what happens. And what I found was the less I showed up, the less I talked and the less I did, the more space I created for them to blossom, to have their own unique ideas. Like one of the things he said to me, he said, Dan, you have to be very, very careful about ever making statements. Why? He's like, because when the CEO and founder makes a statement, it must be true. You don't give them room to challenge. You don't give them room to have ideas. You don't give them room to own because you made a statement and it's solidified. And now it's just, we got to build on Dan's idea, you know? And so over the last year, I've, it's this discipline of really trying to truly hand it off not get involved when it goes a little bit sideways, shut my mouth, stop showing up to meetings they expect me to come to. And then I get an update and I'm like, okay, well, they did 95% of what I would have wanted them to do. And they had 5% that's different and it's substantially better. Right. Yeah. Well, cause they're working as a team, right? Right. A true team. And they have all these different people on the widget scale working together versus me, I'm this wonder and invention guy and I stay in wonder and invention yeah. and I don't have the discernment, galvanizing tenacity and enablement giftings. They're very weak for me and they take energy from me. I hate it, mm -hmm. you know, but when I'm running the show, I've got to operate all up and down the spectrum mm -hmm. and it's not balanced and it's draining. Yeah, it's very interesting that whole question he posed to you of like, do you, do you really want leaders or do you just like the idea? That really hits home for me because I feel like I feel like this whole concept and we're getting that we're talking about today, an executive team and all these all these C level roles and all these fancy titles. It's like a very sexy idea that I think people get caught up in. 
and it's talked about in books like Traction and the E-Myth and every business guru online is saying that you need that so that you can step out. And, and, I, and, and of course, of course, this is, this is, of, this is the next logical step for a, for a business owner, for an entrepreneur like yours with a big vision for the business. This is something you need. I'm not questioning that. What I'm commenting on is, is that, is the realization of like, when you bring on leaders, they are there to lead. That's the central, that's the central word there. And so you need to accept the fact that there's going to be shots that get called by other people, not you. And those, and they might, they're probably going to get it right. A lot of the time, there's going to be every once in a while where they get it wrong. And that I think is a very difficult pill to swallow because now, you know, it's like, you can, when you're kind of obsessed with your own, you know, the organism that is your business, you can be okay with, with, with yourself really blowing it. When other people do it, that's like, that's a whole new level of just like acceptance. But I think the net result over the long term is accumulatively, they're going to get better and they're actually going to get to a point where they're, they surpass their ability, your ability to make the right decision. Uh, to fix the right problem, to bring on the right person. And I just think that that comment about like, do you really want leaders is a good one. The other thing I thought you spoke to really well was that period where you, um, you were already working 60 hours a week and you had to go a little bit harder. Would you say to someone who's listening to this, who maybe is a couple rungs down the ladder from where you are now, um, you know, would you, is it, is it fair to say, hey, it actually gets a little bit worse before it gets a lot better? Yeah, for sure. So like as the leader, um, you, it's re- you're, going, you're going back to school, right? Because there's an admitting of what I'm doing right now isn't good enough or what I'm doing right now won't take me to where we want to go. So you have to start there. And to me, if you don't know, if you've never built a business from zero to 20 million, right, you've got to get with somebody that knows how to get that business from zero to 20. And so there's that initial investment in yourself. I wholeheartedly believe that as the the owner, your greatest investment is first yourself because there's this trickle down effect. Everything that I learn gets deployed to the executive team, gets deployed to the, the senior management team, gets to deployed to the management team and down, and it just trickles down. So it really starts with you. I'll be honest. I mean, I spend over a quarter million dollars a year in coaching, mm. and it's been the greatest ROI I've ever got, right? So during that period, I'm not only learning and being super intentional in learning, so I'm doing my job, plus I've got to go back to school. Mm. You know, I'm basically doing night classes to get my master's. And then I got to do the hard work of executing on those things that I'm learning, right? And so it's frustrating, it's draining, but it goes back to the vision. Like, Mm. what is your vision? Mm. Do you really see it? Mm. You know, because you got to decide, like, do I want a lifestyle business? Do I want a business that I want to exit? Do I want to build a legacy business? What is it that I'm looking for, right? And I was always looking for a legacy business. I was never looking for an exit. I was never looking for a lifestyle business. It's not my, it's not the way I'm written, yeah. you know? And so I had, I had to look hard in the mirror and say, do I have the skills, talents, and ability to take this where it needs to go? It's like, no, I don't. Yeah. I don't know what I don't know. And so it's been a long journey of really, really, you know, super hyper investing in myself and working substantially more hours than I really wanted. Yeah. But, you know, just four years later, you know, I own all these other companies. And at this point, you know, I'll be honest, a year and a half ago, I said to 240 Solutions, this company cannot run without me. Mm. And I truly believed it at the time. And I I don't know, I might have been right. I I may not have. I don't know, because I didn't give them the freedom to own it. Um, Today, 100% beyond a shadow of a doubt, this company would run with me and not Ryan. It would look different but they would thrive, they would smash. And it's because we have given them the liberty to truly own. And when we did that, it's almost like they got wings and they got, they came alive, right? Like we're watching these people come alive and the gold that we saw is coming to the surface. Mm -hmm. And these people that had this underlying talent and confidence you, you just, their life is different forever, right? And 
that to me is the ultimate, like, I love our customers. I love roofing, but my vision is our team and them doing that, Mm -hmm. right? Like running Mm -hmm. and doing what they love and taking care of their family in a different way than they ever could because this industry changed my life and that's what I want for them. Yeah. It's, uh, It's like when you leave a leadership vacuum, the right people just organically fill it. They like they just they just kind of get sucked into it and see that, hey, you know what? There's actually a little bit of extra room at the top here. There's a little bit more I can take on. And these are the skills I'm going to need to develop and cultivate within myself. And it just sort of happens when you've assembled the right people. And that's, you know, going back to the early part of the episode, I think that's why you that's why you work so hard at this top of funnel stuff. That's why you're always, always looking. I, um, I'm curious how you strike this, what seems like a delicate balance between the family vibe and those family values and that culture, but also, but also the structure you need to scale. So how do you, how do you kind of walk that tightrope as a team? Yeah, man, it's, it's really tough. So you have to be super intentional. So um, a lot of it is from the very beginning, making it super clear what people's job is, what their deliverables are. So we, we, we start that with our employment agreement, right? So we're writing out deliverables um, and making that super clear and then reviewing those through GSRs. We want everything to be measurable. You know, we're using SMART goals. We want it all to be measurable. Um, and so you've got that. And then we also want to reward those people heavily for their performance and hitting those deliverables any position that i can pay for performance we always try to do that um then on the family side you have to be super intentional on that relationship so like last friday um we shut so once a quarter we shut down the whole business we do an all staff quarterly meeting so last friday we order in food we do a couple hours of training then we take the company boat out, we play sand volleyball, we go boating, you know, the guys are tubing behind us, we're cracking up, high fiving, you know, listening to 90s rap on the boat and, and being silly, right? Um, we buy Indianapolis NFL Colts season tickets. So we've got season tickets and the whole staff gets uh, a couple rounds of tickets for their department. Um, we, we do things like we bought a fishing boat and we take guys fishing and it's just all these little things. Right. And so it's that concept of work hard, play hard. And then when the team performs, you reward them. And so if you want people to have ownership, they've got to be rewarded like an owner. And when they smash, we heavily reward them. And you know, like this year, for example, um, for for 10 years we've we've really wanted to do healthcare. I mean it's been a huge goal for us and we keep casting this vision if we hit X we'll roll out healthcare, right? And so we we put that goal in place last year. It was based off the numbers that we were given last year, right? Our team hit that number and then we go to the healthcare company and they change the game. It's substantially different. So we sit down at a meeting and the question is like this is substantially more expensive Mm-hmm. than what we were quoted. And so then we looked at and we said, okay, our core is people are our purpose and we're a family run business. What would I do for my family? Right. And so we voted to keep our word pay substantially more and ensure that our team has health care because I want my family to have health care, you know? And so we're making decisions through those values and, Look, at the end of the day, man, family fights, you know, and <laughs> we butt heads and, you know, the, the honestly, the biggest struggle probably that we have here is the dynamic between friend and boss, right? Yeah. And that's, that light switch is really hard to go back and forth between, and we have to be intentional to try to, 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 try to stay on top of that. Yeah. But most people are really good at it. Um, but it is, man, it's a super tough balance. I mean... I've seen the consequences of both. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. I think I've we all seen have both play yeah. out, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a very, very delicate sort of, um, equilibrium that you're trying to find between the two, but it, it sounds to me, especially with that little, the, the tangent on the, like the healthcare thing, that's a, that's a perfect example of like, uh, being able to, to do, to do both at once. Um, 
So I'm looking at this leadership team. I got, I got, I have a, I have a fun question for you. Like you have uh, one, you, one, two, three, four. Looks like four men, two women. Any observations between the differences between men and le- men and women in leadership roles? I'm very, very curious. We're getting into interesting territory here. So yeah, what's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's what's your take on uh, on the pros and cons of each? Yeah. Um... The thing I love about our business is we're super heavy, like outside of field, right? We are heavier on the female side in the office. And um, what I have found is that um, women, you know, historic, you know, from what I've seen, women historically have not got the same recognition that men have got in the trades. And what I found is that some of our women have a chip on their shoulder and they got something to prove, which I love. Um, they're also much more task oriented and task driven, much more organized. And they also consider other people's emotions and feelings substantially more. And so when like we hired our first woman in the office, one of the things that we realized is like guys cursing went down substantially. Vulgarity started being reduced. Like, course jokes got reduced and the professionalism bar got raised and then like at christmas time they're setting up christmas trees with christmas lights and they got thanksgiving things and happy birthday cards are going out and birthday cakes all of a sudden show up and all these thoughtful things that you want from a family-oriented business started happening and it wasn't such a rigid kind of college football you know uh locker room belligerent with (laughs) like jock straps on the ground and all the weird stuff that happens with guys it became this much more balanced organization and on the widget chart like men tend to lean to some of these um strengths and women on others so our our, our, our company became substantially more balanced but my experience is the women that we have are substantially stronger in many categories and are fantastic leaders, they're also disarming. So most men, they're really okay doing this and they can walk away and they do damage, but they can move on. But like, even when I have, like when I do a GSR with our female leadership team and I meet with them, like I just approach them different because they're a woman and it creates a culture that that is much healthier in my opinion. Men are brash, you know, they're, they pop off at the mouth, they got tempers, and, <laughs> it, but they can also be hyper productive, right? And so at the end of the day, my, my philosophy is I think women make exceptional leaders, and I want as many women on my leadership team and management team as possible. If you're a woman that wants to sell, I am dying to hire a couple of women salespeople, yeah. we call them project advisors. And I want them to come in and smash the men here and create crazy competition. Yeah. Because I think most guys are egotistical <laughs> jerks and they don't think that women can do what they do. Um, but yeah, I mean, we have a huge honor for women in our company and they have really uh, performed very well in the trades. Um, it's awesome. Man, they're. So, hey, listen, yeah, if you're listening to this high. and you want to go make a lot of money selling roofing systems with with Dan and uh, it's, you take him up on it, that sounds like a very, very healthy, competitive environment you're you're trying to create there. That's uh, yeah. well, well said. Well said. I, I would echo all those same thoughts. I, could, I couldn't I could say better myself. Same thing here at Breakthrough Academy and the Contract Revolution Show. We're, we have a very, very, very strong um, female component to our leadership team as well. Um just a couple other questions here where as we come to a close, like uh, going back to like interviewing and, and things you look for, I'd ask you about like, what are those traits you really want? We're looking for gold. We're looking for unseen talent. We're looking for that it factor. Are there any real no go character traits for you at kingdom? Are there things that you see or assess or even just feel on an intuitive level when you're making personnel decisions that make you go, uh, uh-uh, this isn't going to work. Yeah, so one of um, our philosophies that we've really been hammering on over the last 18 months is that 
we will not put a heavier premium on production over culture. And so what we found is in the past, we've allowed people who are very toxic to stay because they were high producers. But what they've done is they've hurt the rest of the roster so, so, so poorly um, that, the whole, that the whole environment completely changes. And so, you know, you've got these top producers that most companies can get away with murder. And it's like, yeah, but man, I, I just can't afford to lose that person. No, you can't afford to keep them. And if you do keep them, you're going to pay a heavier price. And we've learned that over and over and over again. And so when we're interviewing people, some of the things that we're looking for very, very heavily is they've got to be coachable and trainable. Mm. If they're not teachable, they will never make it here because we're farm raising, right? So like they've got to be hungry and eager to learn and willing to learn. They've got to put a premium on their team. They have to consider their colleagues and they have to be able to gain trust one one among each other because in our, in our, com our company is actually very compartmentalized. Like our salesmen, they primarily scope, sell, turn in a down payment, and then it gets passed on to five other departments and everybody has to work together and play nice because nobody is seeing the, the, the job from, you know, cradle to the grave. So, um, I mean, outside of that, you know, like I, I would say those are the, the biggest things that we're looking for, but I love people who dream. Yeah. I love people who can see into the future and are, and are willing to pay the price for that. Um, what's next for kingdom, Dan, where, where are you guys headed? We've talked a lot about vision as a concept. We haven't really gotten into yours in broad strokes. What do you think the next few years are going to be about for you guys? What are you really pumped and excited about when you think about the future of your business? Yeah, so our, our first focus right now is is we're building this online university. So um, it's an LMS, and what we're our, our COO is heading that up. And what we really want is a is a, a place for our team to go to get the training and actually get competency testing, a way to acquire badges, you know, prerequisites for raises and promotions. And so it's really this business in a box that's uber predictable. You know, I know a lot of people say, like, if you have to say it more than once, you better record it. And that's kind of this philosophy that we're rolling into today. And so um, another thing that happened was this year as a leadership team, we actually voted to stop growing. Mm. Um, really tough decision. Uh, it's polar opposite of what I'm used to. But what we said is, like, for us to prepare to go, for, you know, our, our original plan was to go from 16 to 23 million, which was 50% growth. And it was kind of slowing down growing. And we turned around and said, like, all of these things that are on our strategic plan, it really requires what we call do, deep roots. And for us to grow deep roots, we have to stop growing up. We've got to grow down. And so it, it, this whole year was about building, you know, very deep roots, super strong foundation, and if that required reducing growth or stopping growth, we were willing to do it. Uh, and so we strategically figured out how to to stop growing um, would be a kind of another topic of conversation. So, mm -hmm. so it, it, now it's about this foundation. Um, next, I would say on our list is going to be a few things. So it's going to be solar. We will roll out solar. Um, I really wanted to do it this winter, but we feel like this deep roots – um, philosophy is we're still working on yep. it. Um, when you grow 455, 600% in a couple of years, you, 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 you can take a breather. Weaknesses. You can take a breather. Yeah. You can afford to take a breather and, and, yeah. you know, get those roots a little deeper. Yeah. Yep. So that's where we're at right now. Next, next session is, is definitely going to be solar. Cool. Um, and in commercial roofing, we're, um, we're very fortunate. We've made some very instrumental key hires in that department. Um, and then, you know, kind of that three to five year, I, I'll be honest, this is the first time that's like, I see these two or three different roads that we can take. And I'm just, I don't have peace about any of them. Mm -hmm. Um, which is a struggle for me because I typically know exactly what I want for five, 10 years. Yeah. And what I'm really waiting for right now is um, I believe we're 12 to 24 months away from 
the business totally operates without me or Ryan being needed or having a job description. And what we do becomes because we enjoy it. Yeah. When we're at that point, we'll have real liberty to truly go after anything that we want to go after because our team 100% understands the ins and outs of everything that we do. And so we're down to a couple things that me and him are still owning. Um, but that's the next 12 to 24 months. We're, we're going to be handing that stuff off. And uh, I think we're going to probably get pretty heavy into real estate too. We're going to continue pursuing that. Very cool, man. Um, are the Colts going to Super Bowl this year? And how many touchdowns is Jonathan Taylor going to get? Yeah, so I would say we're the what do you go the black horse, whatever you want to call it, black swan or whatever it is. I I I believe we'll be at least in the in the the last four. I would say Taylor's going to be twenty ish touchdowns probably. I think that Matt Ryan's a big upgrade over uh, over Carson Wentz, and uh, you guys are in really good shape. What happened at the tail end of last season was hard to watch, and I'm sorry that you had to go through it. <laughs> this is going to be a way better year. Um, where can people connect with you? Uh, if listeners want to want to find you, they want to follow your story. What's an easy way for them to do that? For sure. Yeah. I would say just email me, uh, Daniel at kingdomquality.com. Um, you know, we're, we're happy to help out people. We've got competitors in our own market that we've recommended to Breakthrough Academy, and we know they're learning our silver bullets, and we don't care. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's plenty of work out there, so happy to help anybody that we can. I really appreciate your time today, Dan. It's been uh, it's been a ton of fun. I've learned a lot, some really, really amazing lessons here. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, and we'll have to have you back in the future. Absolutely appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for watching this episode of Contractor Evolution. If you've already subscribed to our channel, consider sharing this episode with another contractor who you think needs to hear it.